Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As I was just sitting there, the Lord was just talking, and he was just saying that this has been a time in him where many have reached out and many have touched him, amen, and have received from him. And tonight is more of a night of thanksgiving, amen. We just need to give him thanks tonight, amen. We need to just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Why? Because he's so good. He's so kind, amen. And he wakes us up every day. Amen. He takes care of us. He's been better to us than anyone could ever be. I don't know about you, but amen. God has been so good. He's been so good. Hallelujah. And I bless God today. Hallelujah. I want to sing a little bit of um, a song and then I'm going to move out the way. But this has been a blessing for us, just the presence of the Lord. Every time we go from one church to another, it's always different. And then God always has a different assignment because there are different things that need to be done, different needs for different people. Amen. So it's never the same. But we thank God for what we have experienced here. We thank God for his presence. And we thank God that many of you are praying. Amen. And even as we leave, continue. Amen. You have an awesome leadership here, awesome pastor. Pastor, thank you once again. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And even for First Lady, wherever she is, amen, we thank God for both of them. Amen. And it takes leadership, amen, good leadership. Oh, there she is. We thank God for you, First Lady. <laughs> amen. Amen. It takes good leadership and pastors and men and women of God that are dedicated, who will dedicate their lives to the service of God and who love God and love God's people enough to make sure that they get what they need. Amen. And thank God that Pastor Bryant brings in people, amen, by the Spirit of the Lord. He brings in those who will minister to help edify and lift up and minister to the people of God. You should be happy and you should thank God. You should thank God. You should thank God for the leadership you got. You should give God glory. You should give God glory. You should give God glory and say, thank you, Jesus, because you're blessed. You're blessed. Hallelujah. And we bless God for that. Hallelujah. Ah. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Yes, I thank you, Lord. For I I just want to thank you, Lord. Does anybody know that song? Well, then y'all can sing it with me. Amen. You've been so good. Yes, you have. You've been so good. Lord. You've been so good, and I just want to thank you, Lord, for you made a way you made a way, a way out of no way you made a just want to thank you, Lord. Oh, we say thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We say thank you, thank you. So on to thank you, Lord. Let's say it one more time. You've been so very good, Lord. You've been 
so good. When I was down and out, you've been so good. You've been so good. When I didn't know what to do, you've been so good. Been so good. Oh, and I just want to thank you, Lord. Let's say it one more time. You've been so good, Lord. You've been so good. When I was sick and the doctor said I wouldn't get well, you've been so good. You've been, you've been so good. You've been so good. Lord, and I just want to thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, and I just want to thank you. You, Lord, for you deserve the glory and the honor. Oh, I lift my hands and worship. Yes, I bless your holy name. You deserve the glory. And the honor, oh, I lift my hands and worship, yes, I bless your holy name, for you are great, you do miracles so great, there is no one else like you. There is no one else like you, for you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. Give God some glory. Give God some glory. Give God some glory. He deserves the glory. He deserves the honor. He deserves the praise. Hallelujah. 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 Go in your Bibles to St. John chapter 17 and in verse 3. St. John chapter 17 verse 3. The Lord has been so kind to us this weekend as to visit us and deal with us, and we're grateful. But we can have powerful services. One of the things the Lord has had to deal with me personally on is stop seeking me for an anointed ministry and seek me for an anointed life. Because you can have an anointed ministry but not have an anointed life. Let me give you an example of that. James Cleveland. Those of you that remember him died back in the 90s, very powerful gospel singer. I just grew up on his songs. Many of his songs ministered to me and so forth. And yet he was found very deeply into homosexuality. He had an anointed ministry, but he didn't have an anointed life. And that's what I'm discovering with a lot of God's people. They have anointed ministries. They can preach. They can sing. They can do. But they don't have an anointed life with God. And so the purpose of meetings are like this is to bring you into an anointed life. Someone, you lift your hand and say, Lord, I need an anointed life. You see, an anointed ministry is mean, meant to be an outbirth of an anointed life. Can you say amen to that? Before we read the word of God, would you just lift your hand with me one and let's just pray together. Father, we are so grateful. We are looking for you tonight just to speak to us very clearly. 
Give us strength. Give us understanding. And let us move by your mercy and by your grace. Help us to eat. Strengthen and stretch our spiritual appetite. We thank you for the performance of it, God, because you love us so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is St. John 17 and 3. Let's read this together. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God. Now, did you notice we went the only true God and Jesus Christ? Okay, this is why you have to study, because if you're not careful, that sounds like two separate gods. The Greek word there for and can also be translated even Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we trust God that he is going to minister to us. I want to speak to you on this subject tonight, life's greatest achievement, colon, to know God. Life's greatest achievement, colon, to know God. Before you're seated, greet some people around you, hug somebody's neck, tell them I'm so glad you are here tonight. Would you put your hands together for Pastor and Sister Brian right now? The Bible says, give honor to whom honor is due. And we do honor them. Amen. I want to thank Brother Kent, who has been so kind to us by allowing us to use his vehicle. Amen. Thank God for you, sir. We appreciate your kindness. Amen. Thank God for my lovely and anointed wife. We appreciate her also. Amen. That's right. Praise God. Thank you. God bless you as you're seated in his wonderful presence. Life's greatest achievement to know God. I, I've grown up in the apostolic faith, and the Lord has been kind to me to allow me to be, as it were, a bouncing pew baby. I, I knew what it was to fall asleep on the bench because service went so long. Now, y'all think services are long now. <laughs> service, they, my good four or five hours, that was nothing. You just getting wound up. You just getting started. You just woke, you was just starting to work up a good Holy Ghost lather. <laughs> and we didn't have, you know, because the, the saints believed you, you had to spend time with God. We don't do some of the things we used to do. We used to have all night prayers. We do shut ins. We'd shut in for three days to the church. Everybody brought their clothes, brought their toiletries, and we would just shut in. Let me tell you, by the Sunday service, many times we shut in Friday, Saturday, Sunday. By Sunday, you didn't have to do nothing. Explosion in the house. God would just begin to minister. But I grew up in that atmosphere, and I thank God for that. But it was the Lord in his kindness who one day came to me and said, although I've allowed you to be raised certain ways, you have it wrong. Now, I don't know about you, but I would rather God tell me I am wrong now. I don't care if it hurts my feelings. If it rocks my world, tell me I'm wrong now when I can change it. Then wait to get to the judgment seat when it's final. And so the Lord began to confront me and say, you've got something seriously wrong. He said, one of the things you have wrong is you seek after my hand and not after my face. You are always after my power, my miracles, my anointing, my signs, and my wonder. He said, what you're not getting is you can get all of that and not get my face. All right, so you can see that by scripture. <clears throat> Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. 
And we'll begin in verse 21, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus warned us of this. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus warned us. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of God but, or into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father. Now, that's the one who's going to enter, the one that does the will of God. Now, our problem is we have told God what his will is rather than asking God. We do that every service. We tell God what the service is going to be. We sit down. We decide who's going to sing, who's going to preach, what's going to happen, and we simply ask God just to bless it. God is going to bring us back into the understanding that the service is for me. I remember Pastor Mangan telling me the story of how when President Clinton was still in office and they were still doing the play of the Messiah, how that he came to that play. And they said they had to rearrange everything because it was now all about the president. He had to have his own private entrance into the church that no one could use. Even after he used it and came through the door, no one could use that until he left. He had to have the entire balcony of the church to himself, along with his secret agents. And then he had to have it so that there was no pyrotex. They couldn't do explosions as far as rolling back the stone because it could be aimed at the president. The soldiers could have no spears because they'd be thrown at the president. Every person on the cast had to be interviewed to see if you had anything against the president. And every person that was on that cast that was interviewed, if you were not there the day that the president was there and there was a new insert, the president was canceling. It became all about the president. Oh, God, even the world understands better than we do. It's supposed to be all about God. All about God and who he is. Move on with me to verse 22. Verse 22, Jesus further warning us. He says, but many will say to me in that day, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have we not cast out devils? And have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? Did you see the category? Prophesying on the name is a category speaking about the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. Casting out demons in thy name is power and deliverance ministry. Many wonderful works covers every other ministry from the salvation of souls to the building of buildings. Now listen to God's response. Verse 23. He never calls them liars. They did what they claimed they did. They did powerful ministry. Here's Jesus' response. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. You made it about ministry when it was all about marriage. You became my maid when I was looking for a wife. You worked for me, but you never took the time to know me. Then will I profess unto you, I never knew you. Listen to this. This to me rocked me when he showed me this. You're a worker of iniquity. How can you be a worker of iniquity and cast out demons? How can you be a worker of iniquity and be used in the prophetic and in the other operations of the gifts of the Spirit? How can you be one that works iniquity and you do many wonderful works? See, we're impressed with all these wonderful works, people being saved, miracles, signs, and wonders. He just shot that all down. I'm not impressed with any of that. What I am impressed with is how much do you know me? The word iniquity means lawlessness. It means that you are living as one who was not given commandment. So although you did all these powerful things, and yes, you did them in my name, and yes, you truly performed them, he sends them to the lake of fire. Because what impresses God is the knowledge of God. I want you to understand this. This is where we've gone so wrong sometimes, even in the apostolic faith. I used to seek God. I remember talking to God one time. I would go to the church and I would just seek and I would just stay before the Lord and ask questions. And the Lord began to talk to me again one day and said, you have something else wrong. 
He said, you think miracles will make people serve me. Miracles don't make people serve me. And God began to let me see it. I've watched people get bona fide, medical, documented miracles who didn't change. I mean, people even in the church. I know this one man of God. I couldn't believe it. I said, he, I, I, said I looked at this man. He fell, he fell from over seven stories, broke his back. They said he'd never walk again. Gave him a documented medical miracle. He's walking, I mean, prolific speaker, prolific writer, doesn't use any of those gifts for God. I looked at him one day, he hardly had his hands up, hardly had his mouth open. I said, Lord, can I slap him for you, please? And the Lord said, no, miracles are meant to inspire you to know me in order to love me. You can only love me as much as you know me. And that's why even though we're seeking for miracles and we think if we see a whole bunch of miracles, people will start to come. They may come, but that doesn't make them stay. What makes them stay is falling in love with Jesus, knowing who he is, living with him. I've seen people get miracles, absolute miracles. I've, I, God, sometimes you just want to just do throat ministry on some of God's kids. I mean, absolute miracles, and then come back the next week crying because they don't have enough money for their electric bill. You go, you're looking at me going, are you serious? God did a miracle for you which contradicts the laws of this world, and now you're crying over an electric bill like God's going to abandon you? You don't know him. When you're worried, you do, you're not knowing him deep enough. God is going to raise up a people in this last day and age, an army of lovers that's going to know their God. Go back for a moment because I want you to see this again at uh, where we were reading from St. John 17 and 3, which we began with our scripture text. This is the high priest prayer of Jesus, St. John 17 and 3. We traditionally call Matthew 6 and 9 after this manner pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We traditionally call that the Lord's Prayer. That is not the Lord's Prayer. After this manner pray ye. This is how you pray. This is not how the Lord prays. The Lord prays according to St. John 17. The entire chapter is the high priest prayer of Jesus. This is the Lord's Prayer. And this is the prayer he begins to make, that this is life eternal. Please make note of this. What is life eternal? That they may know. The Greek word there for know means recognize and acknowledge that I am God. The knowledge of God is life eternal. It is the greatest achievement of your life. Your greatest achievement is not working for him. Your greatest achievement is how deeply do you know him. And because of the society that we are in, we measure too much through productivity. We measure too much through accomplishments, that God is with us if we are accomplishing things and doing things. You must understand that God blesses for a variety of reasons. The Bible says that God actually blessed Israel because he had a name to protect. It wasn't because they were doing everything right. Do not take simply the blessings of God as endorsement. Look at Romans chapter 2 verse 4 so you can see what I'm saying. Romans chapter 2 verse 4. I just want one line out of that. Romans chapter 2 verse 4. He said, don't you understand, don't you know that the goodness of God is meant to lead men to repentance. Many times God will get good to you when it's time for you to repent. Because his goodness is meant to try to push you into his love affair that causes you to change. And so that's why God is going to raise up a people that start understanding him and know who he is. That get into his mind and into his thought process. God is not simply wanting to heal and do miracle signs and wonders. Of course he does. He loves us. Of course he does. But the purpose of that is to draw a person to God. Sometimes you got to back up and ask God, why did you let this happen? 
Why did you let this damage happen in this person's life? Sometimes why God allows it is because you've been praying that they get saved. And the only way they get saved is for something cataclysmic to happen to them that puts them on the flat of their back so that they will come to the realization that they need God. You need to more, do more than just pray for their body. You need to pray that they get the revelation that they need God. For if they get healed without knowing him, what's the point? Do you know what happens to too many people? They get healed by the power of God and then go give that healing and that strength to the devil. They don't turn around and give it to God. That's why God is opening up our understanding. May I be quite honest with you. The more as I grow up in the apostolic faith is the more I recognize how most of us don't know much about God. To the point that when you step out of church, much of God's children don't even want to talk about God. Oh, brother, come on now. Let's not be so spiritual. Let's relax and have some fun. Well, you don't know God. Psalm 16, verse 11. Psalm 16, verse 11. Because you see, God, <laughs> when you understand Scripture and you understand God, Psalm 16, verse 11, thou will show me the pathways of life, for in thy presence is fullness of joy. He is the ultimate fun. What do you mean? Let's relax and have fun and not discuss God. You don't know him. <laughs> because he is the ultimate fun. In his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. He is the ultimate pleasure. He is the ultimate joy. And God is saying, like any relationship, you must invest time. You cannot know God simply by only coming to church. You have to spend private time with God to get to know God. You must study the Word of God. We have too many people that have been in church 20, 30, and 40 years or more that know very little Word of God. God must raise up a people that understand His Word and that can mightily use His Word. Listen to the way the Apostle Paul said it. Go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. The Apostle Paul began to put it this way to us. See, what's happening to us is we, 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 just like the world, we are impressed with power. The world is impressed with power. That's what happens to us in the church. We are impressed with the power of God more than we are impressed with God himself. God is looking for someone that will love him for him. Watch this. What do you do when your faith fails you? What do you do when you believe God for a miracle or for power and God doesn't do it? You go back to your love. For those of you taking notes, just write it down. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. We're not going there. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. The Bible says, faith worketh by love. So in other words, faith is actually infused by your love affair. So what do you do when God does not do what you were thinking he was going to do? You turn back to your love and say, I don't understand you, but I love you. It's not your faith that holds you as much as it is your love. That, watch this. That's why faith is not eternal. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now by the faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these. Faith is not eternal. Hope is not eternal. But love is eternal. We will not need faith in heaven. We will not even need hope in heaven, but we will be in a love affair for all of eternity. Paul said, what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Now listen to him in verse 8. Yeah, I count all things but loss. Watch this, watch this. Paul said, I don't lose everything to gain a soul. Paul said, I counted a loss for the excellency of the knowledge 
I will lose everything, Paul said, absolutely everything I have to gain the knowledge of Jesus Christ. What are you losing to know God? See, we keep measuring Christianity by gain. We measure it by the miracle signs and wonders. We, and yes, please, don't get me wrong. Those things are important and they're powerful. But I want you to hear scripture. Paul said, I don't lose everything to gain miracle signs and wonders. I don't lose everything to gain a soul. I lose everything to gain the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He said, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. The word dung means trash or debris. That I may win Christ. How much time are you investing in knowing him? You can have these powerful meetings. You can experience these powerful things with God. But if you're not careful, you're going back home. And you're living basically your life without him. You have two separate lives. You have your church life and your home life. And you don't live the same way in both places. You have your work life. A lot of you have got this concept that God does not belong in natural things. Well, brother, don't get carried away there. You're getting so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Do you not understand? Let's go to verse 10. I want you to hear Paul's ultimate goal in life. Verse 10 of this same chapter. That I, what? Not that I may preach the gospel. Not that I may win souls. Not that I may see miracles, signs, and wonders. His, the Greek word there for know means to be intimately acquainted with him. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. In the fellowship of his suffering. Being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I may obtain unto the resurrection of the dead. Oh, that I may know him. It is life's greatest achievement. Here's what marvels God. We will go get degrees. And thank God for education. But please remember, education is not salvation. We need education. Thank God for education. But God marvels at us. We will pay for books that we may only use six chapters out of. $150 or more. We think nothing of it. Go get a Bible. If it's $100, that's kind of expensive. Is this a little something cheaper here? We will sit and listen to monotone professors that almost make us fall asleep. And we will pay for this. And we will even keep paying for it after we get the degree because we still owe. You know, we've learned from Disney, I owe, I owe. So off to work I go... But then when it comes to the word of God, somehow you don't have time. You made time to learn about earthly, temporal things. But you won't make the time to learn about the eternal. Oh, God, raise up lovers. Raise up people that prioritize you. Raise up people that understand their greatest life achievement is to know God. Now, in case you don't know this about your God, he has a sense of humor. If you don't believe that, he made you. He made me. God has just a unique way of leaving his signature on you. Just little unique things he does to your body. Your, you know, your, how your second toe sometimes can be longer than your first or your little baby toes curved in. And God has all little things he just puts his little signature on that makes you uniquely you. And what's so amazing is we will take the time to learn all about God's creation, God's body, physical body that he made in being us. And we will learn about all sorts of things, but we won't take the time to learn about the creator. See, the truth of the matter is this. Even the world understands this. When we got fascinated with the iPhone, you know, the next thing we, who we became fascinated with was Steve Jobs. 
We never just stayed fascinated with the product. We went after the manufacturer of the product because we understood if we really were going to understand the iPhone and how it was created, we had to know Steve Jobs. And that's why movies came out about him. Things, books were written about him. The world is wiser. The children of the world are wiser than the children of the kingdom. How are you so fascinated with what God's made and not fascinated with the God who made it? How are you so fascinated with sports and, and fascinated with athletes and not so fascinated with the God that gave them the talent and the ability? How are you so excited about someone who can slam dunk a ball or do a touchdown and don't get excited about a God who slams dunks the sun right in the middle of heaven and then holds that ball up by the word of his power? Oh, God raise up an army of lovers. Somebody shout hallelujah. So God has a sense of humor. When I got my doctorate degree, doctorate in Christian education, doctorate in Christian counseling, the next thing I knew, God had me back in a cemetery working. That's not what I was expecting, Pastor. Have degree, have Bible, we'll travel. But God instead put me into a cemetery and had me digging ditches and things like that. And I said to the Lord one time while doing this, I said, God, I, I don't get this. I thought you were going to use my D, my degree. And uh, he said, I am using your degree. Uh, you have a PhD, a professional hole digger. Um, because what he was trying to get across to me is, although you are doctor, don't bring that to me because you're not my doctor. Come to me in humility. Learn from me. Let me school you. Always come as a student. Never come as a teacher. And can I tell you, that's why some of you are having problems in prayer. You try to teach God what to do. Oh, God, go over there and touch this person. You don't even know what his mind is. You tell him what to do, like he's a cosmic butler. You've got to learn to pull into the mind of God and ask him. Sometimes a person is not healed for a reason. It's not because God doesn't want to heal, but there are things that are involved. And sometimes you've got to get to what you're dealing with the, with the healing or what's needed to be healed, you're dealing with a symptom. You've got to sometimes get down to the cause of what's really going on. And you've got to start asking God his mind. We've got to have a people that can move in accordance to the mind of God, not just move by excitement. We have too many of us that are just moved by excitement. Let's just get excited. That's why when you get home and you get alone, you're depressed, you're lonely, because excitement won't keep you through depression. I'm sorry. What's going to keep you through these things is the love affair. It's when you can look at God and say, I really don't understand why you allowed this, but I will lift my hands and I will open up my mouth and I will declare... I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you and to rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear and let it be a sweet, sweet sound. I exalt you. Somebody lift your hands and tell the Lord, I exalt you. I exalt you. I exalt you. I exalt you. It's because many times we do not study and take time with the things of God. And please don't misunderstand me. God is not here trying to put you on some guilt trip. God does not use guilt, shame, and condemnation. Those are satanic tools. God uses conviction. When God convicts you, he points to your wrong, but he automatically points to himself as your answer. God is talking to you as a lover. He's, he's dealing with you. He's persuading you. You don't understand. This is why God allows you to have earthly relationships to teach you about his relationship. Some of you don't recognize that what God has done is give you living lessons. He's allowed your spouse to reject you and turn cold shoulders to you because that's what you do to him. 
when he's trying to touch you and draw you at home, you don't have time to respond to him in prayer. You've got laundry to do. You've got lawn work to do. You've got other things that are happening. You've got things you want to think about, and you won't push those things aside to make time for him. You've got to do your to-do list, and God's got to fill in or fit in your schedule, or there's no time for God. Oh, God, raise up a people that understand he is the schedule. In him, I said in him, we live, we move, and we have. Jeremiah chapter 9, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 22, hear the, hear the, uh, the prophet talk about this. Jeremiah chapter 9, amen. Excuse me, start at verse 23 for me. 23. The prophet begins to speak this in verse 23. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. In other words, do not glory um, in things that you have gained as far as earthly understandings. Don't let the wise man glory in his wisdom. He said, don't let the mighty man glory in his might. Don't let the rich man glory in his riches. Now, if I'm not supposed to glory in this, what am I supposed to glory in? Listen to what he says, verse 24. He goes on to explain, but let him that glorieth glorieth in this that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, that exercises love, kindness, and judgment in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the... Do you hear what he delights in? He does not delight in the miracle signs and wonders. You want to hear what he delights in? He does not delight in what you think. He delights in how much you know him. He does not delight in the fact that you just simply came to church. He does not delight in the fact that you're just simply keeping some rules. He delights in the facts of how much time you have invested in knowing who he is. Watch this. One of our favorite scriptures, and we need to gain more understanding of it. Go to Romans chapter 8. Verse 28, one of our favorite scriptures that we love to use, Romans 8, 28. But sometimes we don't get the fullness of these things in, until we study. We've got to spend time. You don't find diamonds laying on the surface. Now, you'll find coal laying on the surface. But you're not going to find diamonds laying on the surface. You have to mine for diamonds. You have to dig. And if you want the diamonds of God's word, you're going to have to do more than just read. You're going to have to study. You're going to have to dig. God watches you study anything else you want to study. Even if you want to play video games, you must learn the pattern of the game in order to conquer the game. How come you're not allowed how God moves? How come you don't recognize that God moves in times and seasons? How come you don't know what he's saying about this time, about this season? I'm going to get to the scripture in a moment, just hold it up there. But I was asking the Lord the question from last year. Many of you, of course, remember that in June 2015, the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage. How many know God is sovereign? Sovereign means God is in absolute control concerning all things at all times. So that means the Supreme Court cannot legalize anything unless God allows it. See, unless you get some understandings, you will ask the wrong questions and therefore not get the right answers. The right question is, why did you allow this, God? can't happen unless you allowed it. The Lord spoke back to me and said, let me tell you why I've allowed this. I've allowed it because my church has allowed it. He said, homosexuality and lesbianism has been running wild through my church for years. And all the world did was finally legalize what the church has been legalizing. See, when you get into the mind of God, it takes a whole nother avenue. It gives a whole nother understanding. Romans 8, 28, and we know. Everyone shout, and we know. And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his. Now here's the purpose, verse 29. Please, please recognize the purpose, verse 29. The purpose is not to deliver you. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed into the image of his Son that he may be the firstborn amongst many brethren. The reason why the greatest achievement is to know him is because in knowing him, you fulfill the purpose of becoming like him. 
to be conformed into his image. When you become like him, you don't just praise him when you're at church. You don't just praise him when you're amongst the saints, but from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be you wake up the old saints used to sing I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus walking and talking with my mind stayed on him we need a people that wake up with their mind not focused on their job not focused on their children and their grandchildren not focused on their chores but focused on their God Oh, God, teach us. Oh, God, raise us up. Begin to stir up our hearts again to come deeper into a love affair. Remind us of the greatest achievement. Somebody lift your hands to him again and love on him. I need to know you. 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 Hileleoko sikita la mama shaya. Nereyandere baba horo shikita la baba basata. God is calling us back to a love affair. Can I tell you why God is letting difficulties happen in our lives and in our economy? It is because we have not taken time to get into the mind of God that we do not know many things about God as we should. Let me show you what I'm talking about, friend. Let's go to Romans chapter 14, verse 23. I want the latter portion of the verse, Romans chapter 14, verse 23. I won't deal with the first part. That deals, that deals with eating and eating in faith and not being condemned. But I want to deal with the latter portion of verse 23. He says this, for whatsoever is not of faith is what? Now, there's a new definition of sin for you. Well, I thought sin was just adultery or fornication or homosexuality or lying. No, what sin is, is anything you're doing, the word faith deals with total dependence on God. Sin is when you do something without depending on God. That is sin. The word sin means to miss the mark. You have missed the mark. You don't understand. See, what's happened to some of you, your problem is you're too intelligent. You got yourself a little edumacation, and you can figure things out. So therefore, you don't spend time acknowledging God. Instead, you go to figuring it out yourself. This is sin. Because what you must understand, this is all about relationship. Let me, let me come a little further with you on this. Colossians chapter 3, so you can see this, verse 17. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. You see, many of us, all of us, we have work to do, we have chores to do, we have things to perform. But do you not understand who's the creator of a job? Genesis is filled with what we call the law of first reference. And the first time we see work in the Bible, God told Adam to dress and keep the garden. The word dress means to maintain it, keep means to guard it. God gave Adam a job before he ever fell into sin. So God is the creator of work. And what's happened to us is you have forgotten the purpose of work. To you, the purpose of work is simply to get her done. And do it with excellence. Get the job accomplished. That was never the purpose to God. Listen to what he said. Whatever you do in word... Or in what? How are you supposed to do it? What do you mean? It's simplistically this, my friend. God is looking for someone that even when you're doing your job, you're supposed to be acknowledging him. He said, well, I know how to do it. Why should I acknowledge God? That's pride. Don't you know God can teach you better than your teacher? Don't you know God can always show you a better way? 
Don't you understand the purpose of the work? For those of you that have jobs, you know you work with people. You have co-workers. And what's happened while you work with them? You've got to learn them. You've got to know about them. You've got to know about their private life. Working with someone helps you to get to know them. Don't you understand why God gave you work? It's because you're supposed to be working with God to perform the work. While working with God to perform the work, you're supposed to learn who God is. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. We are joint workers. We are co-workers. You are supposed to be talking to God while you do your job, while you do your chores. You are supposed to be coming to levels of dependence with God. One of the scariest things, apostolics, is we are going to find that many of our people who have been, quote, unquote, so saved are not going to make it. Because we've kept rules and never got into relationship. We have such misconceptions regarding God. And please, I'm not trying to stand up here as an authority on God. He's too vast. <laughs> Come on, somebody say amen. He's too vast. But I don't want to be guilty of what Paul said, forever knowing, forever learning, and never coming to the knowledge of, of what? The truth, and the truth is not Acts 2.38. That's a truth, not the truth. The truth is the entire word of God. Thank God for Acts 2.38, but that's a birth. That's not maturity. We need a people that move on to perfection, that move on to maturity, to know who God is, to understand how God operates. You say, how do you do this? Well, you know the scripture, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with? Lean not to? Did you just catch that? God commanded you to stop leaning on your own understandings. Stop leaning on your own insights. But in verse 6, in all thy ways, do what? And he shall? No acknowledgement, no direction. Parents, you understand this. You make your children, especially when they're young, you make them acknowledge you in all of their ways, and then you direct their path. They want something to eat, they come to you. They got to go to the bathroom, they come to you. They want to go over someone's house, they come to you. They, you, you actually reprimand them for being too independent. Oh, God, learn. Don't you know why God gave that to you? Don't you know why God put you in those positions? It's to teach you how you're his child, and you are never supposed to be independent of him. What is cancer? Cancer in simplicity is an independent cell. It's a cell that is independent that no longer listens to the order of the body. Don't you understand that when you're independent and you don't acknowledge God, you're cancerous. That's why God seeks to bring you back into alignment whereby he is your focus, he is your dream, he is your vision, he is the ecstasy of your life. You're excited about knowing who he is. You wake up in the morning going, teach me who you are, oh God. Teach me your ways. Make known unto me through all the paths of life who you are. Deuteronomy chapter 23, we've got to see this. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 12. We're going to have to read this together. Deuteronomy chapter 23, or excuse me, chapter 24, verse 12. We're going to have to read this together. Oh, I was right the first time. I'm, I'm in verse 20, chapter 24 deals with tithing that I was looking at when we come down. But yes, thank you. I, I want you to read this out with me. You've you got to read this together with me, all right? Let's read out loud. Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whither thou shalt go forth. Okay, verse 13, we're going to be reading down. And thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be when thou wilt. <laughs> Don't you love King James? So poetic. When thou shalt ease thy set of alpha broad, or simply put, when you go to the bathroom. 
That's what ease knows you're spreading fertilizer abroad when you ease yourself abroad. You know they were eating good. <laughs> listen, now, watch God. Listen to God. Let's read. Thou shalt dig therewith and shall turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. Are you listening to this? God started telling them how to go about their bathroom habits. That's how deep God got into their lives. You that say, well, brother, you know, we don't have to acknowledge God in everything. You don't read your Bible. Because you don't seem to understand how deep God gets into stuff. Okay, now let's move on. Verse 14, listen to this. I want you to hear the severity of this. Let's read. For the Lord thy God... I told you God has a sense of humor. What is he telling you? I walk in the midst of it. No, I don't want to step in that. I walk in the midst of it. I don't want to step in that. <laughs> All right, let's start from the beginning. Read that again. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of the camp to do what? And to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be that he see no unclean in the thing in thee, and what? God said, if you do not handle your bathroom habits out right, I'm out of here. I will turn away from you. Now, God didn't... Uh, uh, wow. You say, well, brother, that's Old Testament. You're not understanding the purpose of the Old Testament. The purpose of the Old Testament is not for you to dismiss whatever you don't think is ap applicable. Because some of you are funny. Well, that's Old Testament. Then turn around and read the Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd. Well, that's Old Testament. The purpose of the Old Testament was to teach you what God was after. It was to show you the depth of intimate relationship God wanted with his people but could not have at that time. Now he wants it with you. That's what the Bible means. They without us cannot be made perfect. We have what they desired. We have a right to such an intimate relationship that was written upon tables of stone. It's now written upon the tables of our heart. In the Old Testament, the Holy Ghost, God only moved on the leadership, the anointing of kings, the anointing of prophets. But now, whosoever will. The anointing, the power of God is for all that will be hungry. I'm telling you, the more I study, the more I pray, the more I seek God, is the more I'm blown away. The Lord came to me one day, said, I want to challenge you on something. Now, keep, please keep in mind that God does not ask questions to get answers. All knowing. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, he doesn't ask questions to get answers. Like when you ask Adam, where, where, you know, where art thou? It wasn't because he didn't know where he was. You got to watch God. He's so omnipresent till he'll be where you left him, walk with you while you're going, and then be there waiting for you to come. Oh, no, he's so omnipresent through he's actually omnipresent through time. He's both past, present, and future simultaneously. You know many times how God can simply heal you? God will simply do a moonwalk from your present back to your past, get you when you were whole, and do the electric slide back up to your future and give you what you had. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God doesn't ask questions to get answers. That's why when you're smart and God asks you a question, you do what most of the prophets did. Thou knowest. They didn't try to answer him. When Elijah said, when he, when he said to Ezekiel, can these bones live? He didn't try to get into all, you know. And so when God asks questions, he asked me this question. 
He said, find for me in the scriptures where it says, put me first. He said, you all got this on bumper stickers, seek God first. You all say it all the time. He said, show me the scripture for it. Man, I went to study it. I couldn't find it. I said, what, you, what is this? He said, what happens to my people is your sheep. You keep following each other down a rut. And no one stops to investigate the path. He said, nowhere in my scriptures did I ever tell you to put me first. He said, I'll tell you what I told you, Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the what? Oh, you're supposed to put the kingdom first, which means you're supposed to put the work of the Lord first. But when it comes to me, this is what I said. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, and with all thy strength. I never told you to put me first because that means there can be second, thirds, and fourths behind me. I told you to love me with all because I am everything you have. And when you acknowledge that, you acknowledge that I am the schedule. Your children breathe my breath. Your grandchildren breathe my breath. They, you are to love me with all, not put me first. Oh, God, raise up people with understanding. Raise up people with understanding. Raise up people with understanding. Look at Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. Let me just come to this. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. Listen to what God says to us. Again, the Lord is not trying to put you on some guilt trip or make you feel guilty. He is re reasoning or with you as a lover. He's telling you, as these days are approaching, you have got to know me. This is the greatest achievement of your life. You have got to ask me to teach you how to set aside time. You have got to begin to acknowledge me in all of your ways. So that I can direct your path. What do you mean? Come down to simple things. How can you trust me for cancer if you can't even listen to me tell you to pick up a can of corn? You know what happens to many of us? We end up with a spiritual hernia. You're trying to lift, amen, a mortgage payment, and you've never lifted a candy bar. So your faith gets strained beyond its ability. That's why if you want to start exercising faith, trust God for a parking space. Start with simple, practical things with God. God put these practical things into everyday living to teach you about him. Stop separating the natural from the spiritual. You know what happens? Don't you understand what God did when he made your body? He put your spirit inside of your body. What happens if you take your spirit from your body? The body dies. That's what happens when you keep separating the spiritual from the natural. That natural thing you're doing is going to die and fall apart. The spirit is meant to oversee all natural operations. And that's why whatever you're doing that's not of faith is sin. If you're bored with God and bored with church, you don't really know God. Bored in church. I know it is to be bored with God. Man, when I started finally seeking him and making myself go after him, I never recognized, I never knew how powerful, how beautiful, how wonderful he really is. But when you start understanding things more and more about God, it blows your mind. Let me just come to this. My people are destroyed because of the devil. My people are destroyed because they don't have enough money. My people are destroyed because the enemy fights them. Do you see what destroys you? What your destruction is, is how much you don't know about God. It's not because you've got problems. It's not because your mother-in-law is not treating you right and she's a monster-in-law. That's not the issue. The issue is that if you knew him, you would not be afraid of any man. You would not be afraid of a job or a boss. You would know who your supplier is. I know the God of my boss. And when he or she lays their head down, I know who can hop in their dreams. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
So that's why he said, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Did you catch this? Because thou hast rejected knowledge. And maybe you don't understand. What he's trying to say is, I watch you learn basically anything you want to learn. From a person to a pro, how to use things with a computer, you get a new phone and you will spend hours into weeks learning how to use it. And then what you do with me is find the shortest scripture you can possibly read just so you can say you read a chapter. Hmm? Like Psalms 117, you know? Those of you who know about Psalms 117? Powerful, beautiful scripture. Someone asked, did you read a chapter? Oh, yes. You read Psalms 117. Only has two verses. See, God's looking for someone. I want you to see the next. He said, you can be no priest to me because priests have excessive knowledge of the things of God. He's saying, sing thou has forgotten the law of thy God. Watch this. Watch this. I will also forget your children. Why should I remember your children and your grandchildren when you don't remember me? Because what I'm searching for is a godly seed. What I'm searching for is a godly lineage. I'm searching for someone who the children can look at and say, I want to be like grandma or I want to be like mama when it comes to knowing God. That's why God's going to raise up an armies of lovers. God's going to raise up a people that are not just simply trying to work for him, but God's going to raise up a people that comes knocking on their door with all kinds of troubles and trials. You can look the devil in the face and say, you can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. I understand something about God because he's taught me about him. And I know that he loves me. That's why when you understand this, people can look at you and people can act like they don't love you or could care less whether you die or whether you live but uh, when you lift your hands uh, you say the greatest being in the universe loves me he knows my name he wants me and whoever walks past me or doesn't care about me is nothing in comparison to God almighty because God holds their breath in the palm of his hand and no self you won't give him into depression she will tell the devil I am a child of the king and his royal blood now flows through my veins is there any children of the king in this house clap your hands oh ye people and shout unto God with the voice of triumph You can only love him as much as you know him. How much time have you invested into knowing him? Some of you really don't understand the reason why God separated you, some of you, from your best friend is because God wanted to become your BFF. Because every time it was a problem, you ran to them and you didn't run to God. God didn't die for someone else to have his place and have your attention. He died to have intimate relationship with you. Come on, praise and worship team. Would you come right now, praise and worship team? God is saying to you that if you're going to know me, you're going to have to spend time with me. One of the other problems we have is what we call deep in the presence of God is not what he calls deep. <laughs> As the praise and worship team are getting together, let me just quickly show you this. Psalm 100. Let's start at verse 3. Psalm 100, verse 3. Listen to what the psalmist David said, Psalm 100, verse 3, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Now please look at verse 4. Enter into his gates with and his courts with. Now hold on, hold on. 
When you're praising, according to the scripture, where are you? You're just in the court. You're in the outer court. See, a lot of you think you're having a deep service when you're shouting and dancing and people are running around and woo, woo, woo. You're just in the outer court, friend. If you want to understand the outer court, you're in the parking lot. It's because we don't know him. You enter into his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. You be thankful unto him, and then you what? You bless. See, blessing his name is worship. You can't get to the Holy of Holies by praising God. And unfortunately, most of us don't even know the difference between praise and worship. We use the words interchangeably, and they are so distinctly different. The Greek word for worship is pros kaneo. Pros means towards. Kaneo means kisses. When you worship him, you kiss him. What do you mean? You give your emotions, your heart to him. So if you're going to get to know him right now, friend, you can't come to an altar and just spend five minutes and ease, ease your bleeding conscience to say, I went and I prayed for a moment. Just like anybody, you want to get to know them, you can't just talk to them for five minutes and get to know them. Not real good. <laughs> you have to talk to them for a while. And oh, wait a minute. You can't do all the talking and get to know that person. You've got to learn to listen in prayer and ask God to teach you his voice. Why do some of you know the voice of the devil better than you know the voice of God? You'll even say it. Well, the devil told me that I was this, that, and the other. Why are you listening? Why are you quoting him? And why aren't you quoting God? And why don't you know his voice? Something's wrong, friend, when you've been saved 10, 15, 20 years and you don't know his voice. You're in the house with your parents for 15 years and don't know your mom's or your dad's voice. Something's wrong. How are you in the house of the Lord for 10 and 15 and 20 years and don't know the Lord of the house's voice? How can you be satisfied like that? How can you think that's intimacy? How can you think that's being close? If I could have one epitaph put on my gravestone, it would be this. This man knew God. It's the greatest thing that could ever be accomplished. This man knew God. Come on and lift your hands right now. If you want to come and talk to your God a while and listen to your God, come on to this altar. You don't got to wait for someone to pray for you. You don't got to wait for someone to lay hands on you. Because what happens to so many of you, you'll only really pray if someone lays hands on you. But as soon as they stop laying hands, you stop praying. Come on and spend time to know your God. Teach me who you are. Come on, ask him. Teach me who you are. Teach me your ways, your methods. Teach me your will, your mind. Show me you, that I might know you, that I might know you, that I might know you.